And I don't know what the hell happened to transcripts on YouTube, but I know that I can't find how to turn them back on. But I think that Pete has been turning them on. So I've been getting transcripts for a lot of the calls that Pete is on, although Pete is not on this call. But if anybody sees something that says create transcript, you, you, there's a Zoom function to create transcripts. I'm still trying. Yes, you got it. So uh, I hit um, show captions. Uh, and I think that that's the way to initiate more... transcripts. Oh, captions. Gotcha. And then you can turn oh, like, yeah. I think then you can turn it off if you don't like seeing it. I think you're totally right. I think what happened is they they hid it under captions and I was looking for anything like transcript or whatever and it was missing it entirely. <clears throat> Bentley, thank you. And now I don't have to worry next call. Yeah. Um, because on a call yesterday I didn't turn it on. I didn't get a transcript file. And I'm like, rawr, rawr. um, so sense doing. Um should we recap last conversation for I think only Stacy wasn't here la yesterday? Um, I we could start there. I kind of also want to just start with a check in around sense doing just to see where we are before getting specific on which which projects and so forth because I, I do want to do an update on on what the options are, but I kind of want to do a check in. <clears throat> so anybody want to check in? So my thought, I'm reading that Washington Post gift that uh, Kevin sent around this morning that makes it somewhat clear that um, civil war is not off the table in, in, in the United States. And that agitates me to want to do more sense doing at a, at a, at a, at a much, much higher level. I'm <clears throat> I'm with you. Thank you. And I, I I think the sense of that urgency, uh, whether it's climate disaster or and Klaus, as you were trying to interact with Daniel <clears throat> about, hey, our food system is busy, not changing, and we need to change it, et cetera. There's that sense of urgency that many of us feel that is somehow not making its way properly into the room. Um, anyone else check in? Stacey, please. Yeah, so I just want to say that in the background, they're doing construction downstairs, so it's really hard to concentrate, but there's constant drilling, and I had a flood yesterday, so anyway. Um, but when I clicked on your email to see what the call was about, I saw that I had put something in the chat. So the reason I came is if I moved to put something in a chat, that means that there's something I want to clarify, so I figured I might as well be here. Could be for me. <laughs> Um, sounds great. And please do use the chat liberally. <clears throat> um, that'll be great. Do you hear that, by the way? We are. So when you were talking yeah, earlier, I wasn't. Now it sounds like there is a robot drill about to break down your door. So yes. Avoid the robo drill. It's never a good outcome in the movies. <clears throat> uh, anyone else to check in? Please, Mark. Um, so following up on, on Jack's point, um, you know, the, the reason that I was sort of intrigued originally in by the by the topic of you know COVID and Pete's posts and Grace's posts, et cetera, uh, was because you know they're actually important to all of us on a very basic level of risk management and and information that that ideally we all would know uh, and have made sense of when it comes to COVID precautions. And, and so I, I saw a very practical um, purpose to that topic around the idea of, of sense making, doing whatever. Um, and, and so to, to stray from that to civil war, for example, which I've heard a lot of podcasts on, um, I, I'm not sure how you make, I mean, I'm not sure that you can make sense of that topic. I mean, you can explore the topic certainly, but I'm not. I'm not. I anyway. Um, uh, and you know, in climate change, I don't think tackling a wicked problem makes sense in the context of of a sense making exercise. So, just just some quick thoughts. Um, thanks, Mark. And, and I, the way I tried to describe them a moment ago, I see these these sort of 
cataclysmic things coming at us as motivators for us to step in and do more of this. What we pick as a sense doing exercise matters a lot. And some of these are thorny hyper object problem, you know, wicked problems that <clears throat> I don't, you know, we'll, we'll take bites out of when we can. Um, Stacy, did you want to jump back in? Yeah, um, I just want to share that one of the things I found has been the most effective things to do in a group conversation is to automatically go to the original question and try to see if that's the best way to frame it in the first place. So I just wanted to share that because usually it's not the best way. Thank you, Stacey. And asking the right question is super important. Uh, Mark Antoine. Um, to that, I must say when you, you said about COVID, let's try to understand what would have been an ideal response. And I think on the one hand, that's a great question because often a lot of uh, comments about, oh, the government's doing this, that is like, I don't want to be in their place. Uh, backseat driving is easy. On the other hand, uh, ideal response must include the people's reaction to whatever you're doing. Uh, and, and that's the, the, the point that, you know, it's easy for us to sometimes other, or at least, you know, decry uh other people's reaction totally on board with that and and the question of how diverse our group is remains relevant on the other hand certainly you know there's one thing that is imaginative sense making kind of let's start from first principles and imagine something better that's one type of question there's a what happened here sense making which is more about what are people's motivations and priors so that we can uh, try to repair a broken dialogue uh, they are very different exercises possibly requiring different tools i don't know uh, and that's why being clear on whatever question we want to ask matters a lot thanks mark uh, Brentley? Uh, yeah, I, I would um, kind of expand that a bit in what we've been saying here to say that it's really the first question, because we're not going to, I don't think we're going to stop with just one sense doing, so it's more of a prioritization than saying what's in and what's out, um, would be my suggestion. And then, um, yeah, it, it can involve a large topic, but we do need to probably take a part of it that's not quite as wicked to start with. And I really think the smaller is better. Every time I've done something similar to this in the past, the question's always been too big. Um, but yeah, those are some thoughts. Thanks. Uh, Klaus, do you want to check in? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe um, following up on what Mark was just saying, um, for just from a very practical perspective, I'm just working on our next webinar, actually on our first webinar with this new company we just formed. And the, the topic is soil and water, you know, and bringing attention to the need to, to the linkage between healthy soil and, and, and water, you know, the absorption capacity and holding capacity of water to, to soil. And as we are recording a panel, I have uh, one guy on there who, who uh, owns a hedge fund company. I have Land, uh, Land o Lakes, uh, a panel on there, which is a dairy company you know, that has its own farmers and so on. But the, the, the challenge that my partner and I discussed is that by and large, the industry is not up to speed about the complexity, severity, of a changing climate and the impact that will have on the entire industry. So the the so we 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 are bringing the the, the top. And I just had a conversation this morning with the with this guy from the uh, from the hedge fund. The challenge is to bring the conversation down to common sense uh, 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 statements, right? To where you can explain to a layperson. Um, what this means and how to engage with it. Um, so sense making is really uh, simplifying complex things and putting them into terms that that anyone can follow and understand. 
because we can't solve problems if we don't have agreement on what is the problem. Uh, so, so the and this is the theory you uh, 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 philosophy, right? The the social uh, social systems change management of, uh, idea of theory you is that the first uh, the first major time you spend on the iceberg model, right, is to climb out and understand what are you all looking at, and you can't come to a stage of presencing until everybody sort of gets the big picture stuff. And so we have a tendency to get lost in, in details, get lost in technical perspectives, and to climb back out of that and, and get on top of what, what is the big impact here. So, I mean, in my case, soil, right? It's a really simple concept. We got to repair soil, and then we can put examples around this, and then we can say, here's what it takes to do that. And then you go deeper and deeper. But there is, there is a hierarchy in information. Not everything is of equal importance. And, and I love the Donella Meadows, you know, leverage points of a system way to look at this because you start this narrative, right? And once you have agreement on the top narrative, then you can get into the next, into the administrative layers, into the execution layers, into the operationalizing layers from there. So that's that's how I look at sense making, right? if that makes sense. Thanks, Klaus. Um, Nancy, we're just doing a light check-in round just to see where we are about sense-making and how we feel. Most everybody's gone except me and you. I'd like to go, and then if you'd like to check in, that'd be great. And then I'll and then I'll go to Mark and Bentley, who've got their their hands up. Um, I'm in a I'm in a kind of a strange place about this. Um, partly, it's because Grace and Daniel have left the list, or say they've left the list. Um, just when I thought things were getting interesting. And I, I, I have in my head, I was influenced a lot by Scott Peck's model of community building way back when that says most communities are in pseudo community. <clears throat> and usually it takes falling into chaos and making their way out through emptying is the third step he calls it into true community. And emptying is a little bit feels like group therapy maybe, but isn't group therapy. And it's it's a way of saying, hey, when you did this, I felt this, and then you sort of find your way into a new place. But but his thesis basically told me that it takes often pressure and crisis to actually forge interesting communities because you don't know who's going to leave, how you're going to respond. You don't know about each other in those crises and so forth. <clears throat> and it felt like in a couple of the different interactions we were having, in particular with Grace and Daniel, we were getting to those places that were really interesting. Um, uh, just a tiny example, uh, Grace on email, which I, I don't handle long emails thread well, thread well, threads well, I don't respond in time, I try to make thoughtful replies, and then I, I it, it's, it's really hard for me to participate on forums and threads. I'm much better in calls and in person uh, all the time. So she had asked, hey, Jerry, when you caught COVID, which I did on December 4th, <clears throat> didn't reality smack you in the face? And what she meant was, what she meant was, I think she had a working assumption that I was immune to COVID because I was all vaxxed up. And on the Thursday call last week, I was like, Grace, I had no concept in my head that I was that I had some kind of magic shield. I knew that I was lowering the odds of getting badly sick or maybe even dying from the disease. But I, I, I of course, could pick up the disease. That, that, like, that the mechanism of action is such that there's no magic shield. And I didn't get a reply back and I think she's off the list and all that. And that was just one of multiple different kinds of examples of, we were just maybe getting to the places where <clears throat> some of those things are possible. On a larger scale, I'm frustrated and excited in equal parts because this shit is so hard. <clears throat> and we are a little community who've been here with goodwill for a couple of years, uh, I'm probably getting close to three years pretty soon, I guess in May or, or, or uh, April, it'll be three years. And we uh, we had the Miles Fiedelman incident uh, a while ago where he was basically, he barged in here and said, oh, I know who you all are. You all don't do anything. And in some sense, that struck me to the quick because we we haven't done enough. We haven't done very much. We've chewed slowly on a bunch of different problems. And I feel... Like, I would love to have done more in this group, and I'm not really standing up personally to what I could be doing in this environment, in this place, on these topics that I'm so passionate about. And I'm doing a lot of soul searching right now, 
to figure out how to step up and do more in the new year, which is starting in 11 days. Um, <clears throat> and so, so now scoping back down to sense doing, when this came up as a conversation, it came up partly out of pressure of, hey, Rob O'Keefe saying, hey, people, are we going to do anything? What is the mission here? Are we open global mind? Are we not? <clears throat> There's some evidence that what that Daniel and Grace's critiques are, hey, y'all are open global mind in name only, that there's not a lot of open mindedness here. Um, there's something to what they're saying. I get it. And I think that maybe a lot of us are um, uh, liberal, progressive leaning and uh, have a lot of assumptions that are we're not putting on the table and either questioning or at least ex explicitly acknowledging because what I think Daniel was doing was trying to like get under those assumptions and say, hey, your assumptions are stupid. Um, and we, we, haven't, we haven't had that conversation. We haven't slowed things down enough to be able to get into the meat of those things. <laughs> so when I was thinking about sense doing, um, a, a piece of what turned into this project idea was also Kevin Jones getting really enthusiastic about Marc Antoine's idea loom project and saying, oh, let's do that. Okay, everybody, let's just let's just go do that. And I know that Marc Antoine has a limited time budget, so I was worried that he was being sort of drafted in to a project that he might have not have the resources to do. And then yesterday on a call, I realized something because Marc Antoine explained a bit of how Idealum works, <clears throat> which was that it's very connected to mailing list threads. It, Idealum is designed to absorb a mailing list thread and then make sense out of the arguments made in the thread. And I was busy saying, hey, let's do sense doing. Let's go over and take our conversation over to Mattermost into a channel, which would break Idealum. But then I also was having a different thought of, let's get away from the recriminations of he said, she said, this government was better, that government was better. And let's do a Greenfield's plan for what would a sane government do um, when faced with a pandemic coming in? Like, like what, would, what would have just been better policy in a Greenfield way, which is a conversation I still want to have, maybe not in this setting at all. So I'm, I'm painfully aware that the more specific we can choose something to focus on, the more likely we are to get it done and to have some success. That we need to, pay, we need to scope something pretty narrow and, and, and like stay with it for a while. Um, then we need to figure out which direction to go. And, and Marc Antoine, I'm sorry that you felt like I had just nixed um, Idealum all together. I didn't mean that. I meant, here's a bunch of different paths we could still take. And this is my reasoning behind the different paths, which I'm trying to re-explain here. Um, and sort of my heart is in my throat because I know that we, we kind of want to have some success on some of these things. And every time I take a bite out of the elephant, it's like, man, this thing is tougher than I thought it was. Um, and elephant has more blubber on it than I thought it was. Its skin is tougher. I don't know what metaphors to jump to, um, but that's all in my head and heart right now as we step into this conversation. Um, besides that, I got nothing. <laughs> Nancy, if you'd like to jump in, the floor well, is yours. Okay, so I jumped in because of the idea loom idea, because it's a challenge that I'm facing mm -hmm. in a couple of other spaces where both kind of well well formed and well contained communities all the way out to very wide and dispersed networks um engage in interesting exchange that in the moment has value for whoever is in the moment is in it but then either ages or if you have a slack that doesn't you have a free slack it disappears um and 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 really at the practice level in in the community where we're concerned about practice at the practice level those are gems case stories, um, examples of rifts and variations, all those things are a huge augmentation for the practice and help develop the practice further. But they only benefit those who are in the moment in that second, which is, those are beautiful moments. So there, there's the, the importance of that engagement. And, and, you know, Jerry, I was making notes about, you know, modalities and who's available and, you know, who has the time to actually slow down and get into it versus and there's a billion million threads and more resources are being dumped in and you know i'm not being heard becomes a really challenging dynamic in that flow between information and multiple threads so you know i got ideal i want to try this with the liberating structures community um because as it's grown it's lost a lot of its um 
important connection stuff. And some of that is domain related and some of that is community related and some of it's practice related. I'm, I'm a community to practice junkie. Uh, so I will, I will name my addictions early on. Um, though I'm very sad to hear all this stuff about chocolate, but I won't get into that today. Um, <clears throat> so, and Lucas Chaffee, who is at Kiko Chat and Fisher Kwa and I were happy to have a conversation about this right when this came up in the thread. And I read the thread selectively. I personally don't resonate with a lot of the back and forth. <clears throat> That's just, you know, I'm an old lady. I'll, I'll own that. Okay. Um, and they said, oh yeah, uh, totally. You know, this is really much in alignment with the, with the challenge we're facing. And, you know, Lucas said any kind of connective tissue that he could help design or build. I mean, that guy's so generous. He's, you know, it's like oh, an idea. I think it'll work. Let's do it. I mean, it's just tremendous. So like, how could that link into Kiko chat or whatever? Um, and, and again, linkages are the point here in the end, right? So when it became about COVID, that, that's, and, and that whole thing um, emerged with grace, I'm thinking, okay, this is where we do actually need to pick things apart here because we're dealing with too many different things at once. So, you know, Jerry, when you say, let's start, do something very discreet. Um, I, you know, I think in my liberating structures, the 15% solution, what is one step that I can take that was in my control? I had the resources for, I don't have to ask anybody's permission to do that we can do and see what happens. <clears throat> and so um, it, it, it would be, it would be very interesting to sit, to take a topic or a subset of the community or something else do this kind of what happens when we look at those threads in a different way and just reflect on how those threads look in a different way. Because I suspect, I do not know, that many of the challenges we have with the community dynamics have to do with how we perceive those threads or we're dipping into our email and we're doing something else and then someone starts a new thread or someone changes the title of the thread and all those other dynamics begin to emerge. But if we could actually say, okay, what was in that conversation? What patterns do we see? And, you know, Jerry, this is, I think, the crossing of modalities that you talked about, which is the asynchronous is the kind of gathering, the throwing the spaghetti on the wall, the pulling in. You know, I, I, I tend to see this again. I'm an LS junkie now, totally. I apologize. But, you know, in terms of the eco cycle, what are our standard practices? What are our standard practices are not giving us value anymore? What needs to be broken and creatively destroyed? What needs to be networked out in that, you know, I, I call that the Jerry's brain quadrant, you know, like a million ideas. <laughs> what and how do we get some of those million ideas out of the scarcity trap and into the uh, birth? OK, so what I really see is working that left quadrant first, you know, the networking, getting past the scarcity trap with one idea, working that idea. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, EcoCycle, um, Jerry, you might want to grab that link and throw it in there, too, because it to me. It allows us to recognize that all these other things are going on and all these other things are important, but let's for a moment zoom into this little piece and see what happens. See what we can jiggle loose from all those ideas into some simple action. And note what comes up emotionally, note what comes up intellectually, but don't, don't try and process that at the same time we're trying to just see the patterns, right? And give the other stuff a little bit of space, honor it, recognize it, but uh, I always feel like when I dip into OGM, I feel like I'm in it. Uh, is there's so much going on at the same time that I, I can't settle with any of it. It And then I go like this, right? And I don't think that's an unusual feeling in any email. I mean, I see it in the other communities I'm active in. Um, and it's only in the very mature communities who've learned that the stew doesn't happen in the email list. It happens elsewhere then they can just keep on going on and things are fine. And those other things are happening in other places where they can have the kind of attention, uh, critical thinking, or even tenderness that just doesn't exist in that loop, 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 speech over. Um, before going to Mark and Bentley, I just would like to take us into a moment of silence so we can process all that. That was really lovely, Nancy. Thank you. Made sense at every turn. Yeah, crazy.
Mr. Trexler. Um, well, just going back, really just, I guess, for a clarification in terms of, of what, what I think Mark Antoine took from my thing, um, I, I, I'm not at all interested, well, I'm interested in the topic, but I, I don't think it makes sense to go back and say, what, how should we have managed the pandemic or how should we manage a pandemic that might happen in the future? I mean, that enormous topic, um, uh, and, and we, we don't really have the expertise for that topic anyway. Um, it, but what had struck, well, but what had struck me, you know, when Pete circulated his, here's what I tell my friends about COVID. And then there was the back and forth between Pete and, and, and Grace a little bit on that list, that, that specific set of points that he had put out. Um, and, you know, the fact that Pete, my understanding is that Pete this week in California with family, he's, you know, they're wearing a mask and a very advanced mask indoors all day with family members. Um, and, you know, I'm intrigued by that. And does that make sense? I, you know, I've got family members here and I'm not doing that. Am I being stupid? Um, and so, it, you know, that, that seemed like it, it might be a piece that we could bite off and play with Idealoom because it'd be great to, to, to do something good with Idealoom and figure out what we could do with Idealoom in the future. Um, but, but, you know, Pete's, Pete's 10 points plus the point that he didn't have in there about COVID is causing inflammation and then is contributing to all these other diseases and why we're having outbreaks of all these other diseases because it's knocking down your immune system. Again, I have no idea if that's true, um, but I would love to know. Uh, and, and so th that just struck me as a good starting point, a very constrained starting point that might fit the group well. So by the starting point, you mean Pete's list specifically? Yeah, I mean, Pete's list, Grace's response. I mean, that seems to me like a, a great starting point for, for picking that stuff apart and figuring out, okay, are there any hidden assumptions in here that, that, that you know, underlie what Pete's saying well, or, you know, I et love, cetera? I, I love how Grace's first response was, why the hell would you publish this or tell anybody this? And I was like, wait, what? But that, that's sort of how she came back at, at Pete. I was like, wow, why, why would you not want to have advice like this? Um, Bentley. Yeah. Um, I'm open to all of these. I did um, want to, um, Klaus had kind of said what uh, the concept of sense doing means to him. And I think it's a very, it's been used to, as a placeholder for many, many concepts. Um, so it might be interesting to talk about what our area of interest is and what concept we have in there. I would um, agree that sense doing includes, and for me, the, the understanding of sense doing comes from, we were, we were talking about sense making. And uh, so just sense doing was just kind of a way of saying, okay, let's do some sense making as opposed to the concept that may evoke of of taking action out in the world, um, uh, and Klaus seemed to, and you can correct me, Klaus, um, uh, be focusing on the the aspect of communicating to other people in a clear way, and I believe that is definitely an important part of collective action. Um, but the area that I'm kind of more focused in, which I think I would like to include in our shared understanding of the title of this topic is the determining what the situation is and the best actions are and taking into account the um, the full collective concerns and understanding about that. So making sure that voices are heard, which we've talked about, and uh, that we're taking all that into account, which will also help us explain it to people that come in with a different uh, prior understanding. Um, uh, so that's, and, and I'm actually more kind of interested in the, in the making sense of a situation as opposed to communicating in a sensible way, uh, to other people, although I, that's definitely part of it. Um, and then maybe we should throw out topics. I would suggest 
I, I'm okay with taking one of the, those COVID topics. Uh, I would I, I would suggest maybe even taking one of them rather than the whole list or starting with one and then expanding as we see fit. There's also the possibility that if some people are really not interested in the specific topic that some, you know, let's propose, I don't want to actually like split us, but um, if there's another topic someone's passionate about than other people, you know, they can still raise it and other people, it's not like we're saying you can't have, can't do sense making about this other topic. But um, if you're really, you know, uh, that may be something we may consider that some people may be willing to participate at two at a time, but just a thought. Thanks, Bentley. Mark Antoine? Uh, somebody pointed out uh, earlier what are definitions of sense doing indeed and uh, yes indeed Nancy what is the purpose because I was uh, I was once we were uh, in a project in which Idealoom then assemble was conceived uh, Simon Buckingham Shum was in involved and he presented a model of collective intelligence as being on the spectrum, which later became a spiral, but from collective sensing, collective sense making, collective ideation, collective decision, and collective action. And then, of course, from the action, you sense the results and loop over. Uh, and collective action is a very different type of tooling and a diff very different type of, you know, what are we trying to do and how are we doing it? Is sense doing towards that end of that spectrum? Or is it just, let's actually do the damn sense making we've been talking about for so long, which I think is also a goal. Uh, certainly, certainly just backing up because I'm, I'm going in many directions here. My idea, like when we, when we designed Idealoom, the idea was people, these conversations go in all kinds of, uh, of directions good moments come, good moments go, they're lost in the flow, and we need to create a map of everything that's being discussed, both so it's more approachable, more intelligible, nobody wants to read the damn back, con back conversation, and that's entirely uh, understandable. So helping people carve out, okay, this is the part of conversation that interests me, let's carve it out as a little micro domain and we'll have that little conversation there and be still be aware that there's this other part of the conversation. And at some point we may realize that they're mutually relevant and make the link uh, and, and, and join them when appropriate. But, but being able to uh, capture what emerges, that's extremely important and make it into its own more synthetic uh, structure, the, what, what Jack has called uh, turning flows into stocks, uh, as absolutely important for onboarding, but also for the people in the conversation, and, in, and it enables uh, sense makers, like people who are trying to get an overview of this or that part, to create these local, okay, here's this curated view of this part of the conversation. This is what's happening in this corner of the world. And let's give a TLDR for people who are overwhelmed by the whole mailing list, as always happens. Um, now, of course, this was before Slack existed. This whole uh, design was pre-Slack and now, or, or Mattermost or whatever. Now people are in channels. And I think the problem, it, it helped people not be overwhelmed, but it created little silos and people don't cross as much and don't cross pollinate as much. My feeling, my impression from seeing Slack and Mattermost channels. And, and, and it's very hard to say, oh, we've been discussing that in that channel. Let's take this bit of the conversation and bring it back to the plenary uh, townhouse, what, town hall, whatever it is, without inviting back people into it and, oh, then you're, you should have read the, read the whole thing. So, so the, the act of synthesis is extremely important. And it's, Idealoom is one answer to it. I don't think it's the final answer. Uh, it's one answer that is, I think, quite well adapted to its original object, which was mailing list. Are we, if we take a specific question like Bentley was proposing, let's use something that is more appropriate for 
starting with the synthetic view. Like Idealum is about making sense of something that's a bit overwhelming and goes in all directions and carving it out. If it's if we're starting from scratch, it's not the best tool. Uh, could propose sense graph for that, can propose um, the debate graph. There's all kinds of good tools. We can do it in my reward. That's fine. Uh, I'm really not trying to push idealo. I'm trying to say, what part of sense doing are we interested in? And the whole making mapping the diversity, I think, is for me a key part of sense making. Mapping which and diversity? The diversity of ideas and interests in a group. Cool. I mean, we have we have the, the, the whole point is open global mind is trying to be a diverse and sometimes failing, but it's trying to be, but it's difficult. It's very difficult. And and I made a comment in the chat earlier. We all come in the conversation with past wounds. Um, and, and, and people take offense, and sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly. Uh, I remember when Grace took offense, uh, not, uh, sorry, not, yeah, Grace took offense when you asked her, oh, do you mean this or this? And it's like, that is so limited. You were asking a question, but also, yes, it was <laughs> a narrow thing, but it, she could have expanded. <laughs> it's, it's, so that's, that's past wounds. We've all been put in boxes. And, and being able to say this belongs on the map. The, the reason I'm not working so hard in Idealoom so, so right now is because I think it's important to let many people create different maps and then see where they mesh. And that's the whole hyper-knowledge work. Uh, because Idealoom has this idea that let's put everything on one map. And then the map itself can become overwhelming. I mean, yeah, it's a fractal. It's an outline, so you can collapse. But one map to rule them all is as problematic in its own way as uh, one conversation with everything. That's so appealing. <laughs> Every uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> oh, good movie. Um, didn't see it. Uh, worth, worth watching. I'm curious. Anyway, as, I'm going a bit again in all directions, but I really want us to refocus on do we want to focus or do we want to see how broad the universe is. And those are totally both important goals, but we have to choose. We may, They're we all valuable. They're a, both valuable. We may have to take a poll on that uh, shortly, I think, uh, just to figure out where we are, uh, which way we're leaning. Um, Klaus. <clears throat> yeah. May I take another stab at information hierarchy? Can, can I take the screen for a moment? Go right ahead. Go right ahead. Okay. So McKinsey just came out with this massive, massive collection of data um, and moved it into, um, into uh, meta-level uh, compilations that you can then spin off from. So let me show you one, um, one thing here. Okay, so let's take a look at this thing here. So I'm in agriculture, right? This is this is the whole world here of, of emissions. So when you look at agriculture and you look at carbon, for example, there's one single dot. So it's going to come back in just a moment. Um, so so uh, no, you see up here, you no, know, who's responsible for what? So let's just start with um, here is carbon coming in. So there's one single dot. Right, that, that represents agriculture in terms of CO2 carbon emissions, um, which I think is underestimated because I think they're underestimating logistics and, and transport. But then when you come into methane, look at what, what uh, agriculture is doing. Then you come into uh, nitrous oxide and it's all about agriculture. Right? Nitrous oxide, of course, is fertilizers, right? It's synthetic nitrogen and methane. Uh, which is being used in ginormous uh, volumes. So now if I'm if I'm looking at this thing, where do I spend time, right? Where, where is the biggest impact that uh, we can do in, in agriculture, which contributes roughly one third of total emissions because nitrous oxide and methane is about a hundred times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than is uh, carbon. Yeah. 
it, it lasts shorter, but it is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So, and, and by the way, there are a lot of groups as Regenerate America, you know, there's a lot of think tanks who are in there who are, who are consolidating this information. They're interacting with uh, the, the, both the Senate and the House agricultural committees to explain, you know, what are the options here? So obviously nitrous oxide is like the elephant in the room, right? So, so what, what can we do to reduce the amount of synthetic fertilizers, nitrogen that's being poured onto these fields um, and uh, uh, pollutes watersheds, you know, creates dead zones uh, in, in the oceans and all of that stuff. So Klaus, yeah, no, go ahead. Um, rather than building the argument that you're passionate about, which I agree with, can you come back to sense doing like what uh, what you're showing us a report from McKinsey, which has a visual that's that's interesting. Um, are you saying <clears throat> this visual is essential and we should go there? I, I'm, I'm you're taking us down into the argument, which I, I want to avoid doing that. Sure, sure. Um, so, because that's not this call. Yeah. So so what I'm saying is there is data available that. Um, that describes phenomena and explains phenomena at, at a meta level, right? Then take the Donella Meadows approach of a hierarchy in information that rolls through the economy. So if we are starting at the narrative level, you know, uh, of understanding what are the core, this is you know, uh, uh, one level, that's the top level. One level down, you go into sectors of the economy. Then when you go into sectors of the economy, you go to the next level down and you prioritize you know the 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 uh, key the key intervention points, the key leverage points you know, that you that you need to address. Then you get go down to the next level. And you look what are the socioeconomic impacts? How does this impact the workforce? How does this impact uh, the the uh, system of agriculture and food? Right, because it's all connected. You can't change agriculture unless you change menus, unless you change the supply chain aggregators, processes, and so on. So that's what I'm saying, is the, the clarification that comes out of looking at, at information in a hierarchy, you know, it allows you to then go through the steps required to, to break this down into greater detail. And there is a space for everyone. You can get, you can step every, uh, at any uh, a point into this system and say, here's my spot. This is what I know about. This is what I can do about it. But you're within the system, meaning we're moving the system into a common direction. You know, and, and if we can't set up this, this hierarchy in information, we can't define direction. And that means we can't collaborate on a large scale to solve problems that are complex but need solving, right? So, so that's uh, hopefully I, I uh, was able to. Thanks, thanks, Klaus. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm going to make an analogy here, and Klaus, tell me, uh, tell me if I'm missing the mark here. But when when I'm when I ask the question, what would a healthy society do to deal with an incoming pandemic? <clears throat> I kind of meant, how do we draw large scale? Yay, Rob's call ended early. <clears throat> um, how do we draw? some large scale conclusions about um, how to approach uh, the, the situation, what to do about uh, trust and transparency and all those kinds of things. And then to work your way down to actionable items for, oh, that means that we should have this kind of data fed into a place where people can monitor it. <clears throat> and these kinds of actions like mask recommendations and availability and test recommendations and availability and what are the, all that kind of stuff. And then, an actor can step into that mesh of ideas and go, I'm an individual in a high contagion university in a community that's not masking, what should I do next? <clears throat> now, by analogy, in, I'm a small farmer uh, who's got some livestock and some, uh, and, some, uh, and some land that's this kind of fertility in this marketplace over here, what should I do? <clears throat> and so, so I think the system you described earlier would be lovely from my from my eyes if it ended with or it included uh, portals, places where different participants in the system could show up and say, "What is the best possible advice for a player like me? What what you know what, what should I go do?" And then 
here's how to fund it, here's instructions for how to do it, here's who sells it, uh, here's a subsidy, whatever, whatever else would make that, that action happen faster. So, so healthcare, COVID, uh, soil, water, uh, regenerative agriculture, I think they're, they're very parallel. They're both gigantic, thorny, uh, wicked problems, <clears throat> but I can see my way through being part of a much larger community that builds some assets that do that. I mean, Perfect. What the, what the McKinsey charts weren't showing me was uh, all the circles looked alike and they were really nice in terms of proportion of inputs and all that, but I couldn't tell that methane was a whopping bad problem and was about to wipe out the ionosphere. Oh, I'm making that up entirely. <clears throat> I couldn't see the scale or the flow of the, or the connection of the issues at all. I just saw a lot of circular diagrams. And to me, we need, we need a, uh, a complementary set of <clears throat> diagrams and visualizations that very few people have done yet. I mean, I, I put in the chat sand key, di sand key flow diagrams, which show you <clears throat> here's all the fossil fuels that we're digging up and here are all the industries and all the ways that they get used. I've seen really powerful sand key diagrams and you're like, oh my God, okay, we should go over here <clears throat> and make and you know make this sort of discussion. Um, and that's one tool among many with the same sort of sets of data that, that you were just looking at, just seen in a different way. How do we get somewhere there. And, and, and I just described something that's much a much larger thing to bite than we can bite off. <clears throat> but I disagree that we're not able or don't have expertise to take a, a swing at some piece of it. So that's that's why I'm talking about that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing that we are not capable of put it, taking a swing of it. My argument is putting the information into a hierarchy where you, you, you uh, except here, the, I mean, the, the overarching complex, the, the overarching system, it's mm -hmm. like what you see here, methane and nitrous oxide are really dangerous and agriculture is the main contributor of it, right? So that's where you start. And then you go down from there to, to build up uh, the, the, the pyramid basically of, of uh, uh, the, the economy, the ecology related to that topic. Now, and then you can get if the farmer you know, uh, uh, in, in Bend, Oregon can then uh, step into this and see what applies to him without having to understand the entire pyramid. Yeah. Um, thanks, Klaus. Nancy? Unmute myself because I'm coughing a lot. So, so I, I want to take something down to this. Like, And my research question is, how does a large, hopefully diverse, sometimes um, pugilistic community uh, see, understand, and use its conversations for some purpose? And so with OGM, I think the first question is, over an, a year, let's just take a year, over a year, what was this community interested in? Where did those conversations go? Did any of them come to conclusions? Did any of them suggest action? Did any of them cause um, conflict? Did any of them cause creative abrasion, which I would say is, you know, the two, the yin and the yang of, um, and, and just look at an X period of time and notice what was our practice? What happened? Because if we can't reflect on how we have been acting, it's hard to say how we might act. And to build that kind of model that you're talking about with the, you know, using data constructively, if we don't understand how we can do that as human beings as the warm part of this whole thing, the rest of that is beautiful, but probably won't turn into action. So what if the experiment is to reflect on what OGM has talked about by sucking out these threads, doing some sense making of a month, a year, two years of conversation, bringing that back for a conversation of how does that land for you? What does that suggest to you? Of all the things we've talked about, what's the thing that we could actually do something about tomorrow um, that could contribute to these bigger pictures? I, this is not to malign the big pictures. It's to hold the big picture with something tangible and actionable at the same time. Um, and then have the side spaces for the types of conversations needed that would give a place for a conversation, like if you and Grace had that conversation that she started an email in a phone call or a face-to-face -face conversation, I'm sure it would have ended in a very different place. I'm pretty damn sure about that. So I'm kind of hearing a motion, an unofficial motion on the floor, and I'm going to make this up as I go along. Please, everybody correct this. <clears throat> to take Pete's 
page about here's advice I give friends about COVID and Grace's reply to that. And I don't know how many messages to the left or right of either of those or anything else that happened, but to start with those two messages, uh, drop them into Idealum if that, if that seems like a fit, like a fit project and then see where else it takes us and slow it down and expand on it. <clears throat> I can, in the meantime, I'm happy to sort of come at the question from the, what would an ideal society do about this? Like, like, cause that fits right next door. It, it, it's, it's, you know, part of the conversation is, well, but we didn't do this. And this is why I said this. And I recommend this because we fucked up that decision way early on. And it's like, cool, cool. <clears throat> um, so and, and from that slowing down and reifying or visualizing <clears throat> that little snippet of conversation, we could get some work products that would allow us to see what we do. Uh, and we could then see where that, uh, what's next, the way Nancy just recommended. Thoughts? Objections? Extensions? Contractions? And Nancy? I, I would... I have a gut reaction and this may be just being contrarian and you're welcome to smack me down. I'm totally open to that. But by choosing that topic, you're poking a bear. Um, so oh. this is the reason I was hoping maybe to avoid the controversial topic in that sense. So I agree or, or kicking a hornet's nest or whatever metaphor we want to use. So I, I, if, it, if you look at that moment in a wider context of conversation, I think it may be a door that more people will walk through than a door that some people say, I want to get into this topic. Um, and I think both are viable, but I'm curious about what happens when you open the door and say, what are we, what are our conversations? And then let's look at some of those separately rather than starting with a particular conversation. And this is a gut reaction and I'll leave it at that. And also if, um, <clears throat> If Grace has left our conversational space, then she's not there to represent her side of the argument. And that's actually sort of neither fair nor useful, <clears throat> although we could try in good faith to do so. And I wouldn't object to that, but it's not nearly as good as having Grace actually in the conversation. Bentley. So uh, I think Nancy's suggestion of taking a step back and looking at the using OGM as kind of a case study of sense making in the wild is is interesting. Um, it's not something I'm interested in. <laughs> um, I I and so that that's just a personal thing. Um, I'm more interested in trying out new ways of sense making, and I think there's been a lot of analysis on how people have done in the wild do sense making and email lists and stuff. Um, so it's not as fruitful um, for what I'm looking at. But I mean, if that's something other people want to pursue, that's it's certainly a good thing to do. What would um, make you really happy? What can can you describe? <clears throat> can you describe an exercise that would like really please you and make you want to like leap in wholeheartedly? Yeah. So I would like to take uh, maybe like one of the bullet points from what. Uh, uh, Pete was saying, rephrase it in, you know, if there's a future pandemic, how would we handle that? And then look at, you know, conversations about that across the whole internet and try and synthesize what we do and how we'd explain it. Um, on that, that's kind of small topic. So look at actual evidence, you know, for um, people are, are doubting that we should do this at all. You know, take masks. Should we wear masks in the next pandemic? Um, what are the reasons why they're doing that? Why that they doubt that that's useful? What are the reasons? Why, what do we actually do? We have evidence that we should or shouldn't, and then find a way to synthesize that and and put it out for other people, um, so that when the next kind of surge comes, we can make a statement about masks or one of the other topics in there. That's. That's what I had hoped for when I heard that uh, this conversation. But let's let's stick close to masks for a little bit. One of the things that I think that some people feel aren't being represented in the mask discussion <clears throat> are the social impacts of mask wearing, uh, in particular on kids. Um, I I think that um, that doesn't get represented a lot when people are like saying, "Hey, there's a lot of scientific evidence that mask wearing reduces." 
you know, uh, the, the replication or contagion of the virus, blah, 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 blah. You can go down that avenue for a really long time. And system.com <clears throat> is a website. I don't know what they've done on COVID and mask wearing, but system.com is designed very specifically to do causal relationships based on research. That is their focus entirely. And Adam Bly is the founder. I think he's an ex-Google guy. <clears throat> I had one conversation with him a few months ago, kind of in the in the OGM kind of realm. And he might be interested in playing, you know, uh, some part of that. If they've got a bunch of material on mask wearing and COVID, for example, that could be really interesting. Um, but I'm I'm afraid of getting into a researchy blind alley if all we're doing is trying to find, hey, here's a study, here's a study, this study refutes that study, this study didn't have enough, and you know, n, n equals six instead of n equals six million, <clears throat> whatever that might be. I don't I don't know. Uh, other thoughts on. Following so one of the bullets. Let me kind of respond to that. Is Please. that I, I think that you need to explore the whole space, and that will include a hundreds of studies, and it will include uh, how people how it was communicated, and it will include people's emotional response to it. I don't think we can, if you put an arbitrary kind of don't want to go down that rabbit hole, then it's, I don't know that there's much value in doing it at all. And that's why the topic has to be smaller. So maybe it's just children wearing masks. Entirely possible. And, and, and when I say I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, I just mean I lose interest when it turns into a comparative research results kind of thing, but that's not, that that's not a really valid and useful thing to do. Um, or... Well, I, I think we need to discuss that as well because a lot of people think it's unvalid because it's not communicated well not that it's valid and they kind of gloss over the fact that the reason we have a narrative to communicate is because someone did that work and there's a whole bunch of like science communication that, that that's at play here that's super interesting to me um very early in the pandemic some <clears throat> some guy went and put goop on kids hands in a classroom sorry <laughs> he basically cleaned the classroom got a bunch of kids in and their teacher put goop on one or two of the kids hands and then had everybody just play for an hour and then went around the room with a black light to see where that goop had shown up and that goop is made on purpose to show up under black lights and it was fabulous because that goop had gotten everywhere now turns out covid is more contagious through uh aerosols than fomites so maybe that's not the right example and i'm wondering why nobody made a video that says hey pretend that covid is like smokers and smoke <clears throat> Because it smoke hangs in the air. You know how when you get in an elevator, you can tell a smoker was just in the elevator? That's how COVID works. Like nobody did that video. And I was like, why did nobody do that video? Um, yeah, I, about toilets, Nancy. I lived in Hong Kong just before SARS hit and may in fact have contracted SARS. I don't really, we'll never know. But but once I left and SARS really hit, hit Hong Kong, the G apartment in a building would all get COVID, would all get SARS <clears throat> because of the flushing. Because the flush would aerosolize and there was contagion because that was a common pipe across the G flats. G flat sounds like music, but I don't mean that. <clears throat> um, but super fascinating once people start to sort of piece together how these mechanisms work. Other thoughts on this? Hey, Michael. Hi. One thing that I'm always, I don't feel I have the right answer to that is how much does the sense making we do within a group? And, you know, we try to collectively create that artifact that maps the group's thinking, which may or may not include outside thinking as mentally as proposing. I have, I think both are valuable, right? Starting from what's inside a group or including others, both are valuable. But how transposable is the in-group sense-making to allow others to come in and say, oh yeah, they've done the work, we can reuse that, we can uh, found ourselves in the work they're all, uh, they've already done. I don't know. That's something that's uh, very, very, I'm very curious about. How much can we like we've talked a lot between me and Jack on on uh, sensecraft to at some point being able to import a whole branch of the argument into another uh, discussion. And I have a weird mechanism to import branches between idea loom conversations because it is something that is uh, it's all it's all about trust, right? and And as I said in the other conversation yesterday, 
tr building trust is more important now than the exhaustive mapping in a certain way, because it's so easy to fill the map with fabricated nonsense um, and, and, and defining the trust boundary. On the other hand, if the map excludes viewpoints, then people won't trust the map. So that's the other side of that. So th this is this is for me, that's a big research question. You are digging in, in terrain I really love. <laughs> um, uh, and Gene Bellinger um, does a lot of really good Kumu visualizations. And when I look at the completed visualization, my, my mind cannot wrap itself around them. <clears throat> the only way I ever really understand them is when he does a step through and says, here's the start of the cycle. Then we add this, then there's this, and then there's this. <clears throat> and all of a sudden with some effort and some listening and some patience, I can now start to see the dynamics. And I've never gotten to the point where then we start turning, tweaking the variables going, hey, let's raise the number of wolves by 20% and see what that does to the system. Never done that. That would be really kind of cool. But by that time, I've run out of time in some sense. <clears throat> so I, I'm afraid that's true of a lot of good deep analysis and, and visualization and presentation of issues that <clears throat> for the people who did it, did the work. It's like really good and rich and contains tremendous amounts of information. But for outsiders, it's really hard to absorb what it means and how it works. And there's this magic art of science communication or whatever else that bridges that gap sometimes really well. And more often than not, that 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 gap just exists. That gap never happens. I don't know if anybody else shares this, this point of view, but I see way too many <clears throat> explanations that look rich but are impenetrable. Can't tell if anybody agrees or disagrees. Nancy, and then Mark. I, I I just am wondering what. All of a sudden, I realized we have an incredibly inclusive definition of sense making here. That um, that I'm 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 bouncing between. So when you go, so your example from Kuma was a perfect example because making the map is a kind of sense making. It's a Perhaps you could call it a data-driven sense making with the opinion of the map maker doing some of the sense making. So that's one kind of sense making. The next one is, okay, how do I share that with my community or a group of people? And giving the map doesn't work. The step through the, the you know, oh, if you move this, look what happens. It reminds me of that Swedish guy who did all the stuff around, you know, manipulating maps so people would understand how you push one thing and another thing happens. Then the third thing, which I actually think is outside the boundary of my perception of sense making, which is communication of stuff that we have made sense of. So an infographic that goes out to a million people, that's a tool for their sense making, but that's not sense making in the in the sense that I'm, oh God, I'm tripping over the word sense, that I'm thinking here. Um, and what I notice in conversations is some people are immediately going to the infographic. I'm using that just as a placeholder. A reified artifact that makes, oh, this is why I should put a mask on my kid, or this is why it doesn't matter if I put a mask on my kid, right? Um, and But a whole lot of the sense making in that particular conversation was who do we believe and who do we not believe? It really doesn't have to do with COVID, right? It has to do with a breakdown of something in our society. And when you're sense making that, it's very different than sense making about mask data. So I think one of the, I think one of the reasons I'm concerned about the mass conversation is if you do it, we need to sense make about that societal and contextual stuff before you get to the data or or maybe I don't know maybe before that just me making up shit. You're not you're not make, just making up shit. What you just said is crucial and like in the crux and in the middle of what's happening to us as a society. And if we can sort that out, <clears throat> then we can have some of the other conversations. But we don't. We don't ever get to the, hey, look, I have a lot of evidence that this thing is true and we should all just do this thing. We never get to that. And, and when, when I'm explaining OGM to a, to a newbie, I'm like, OGM is kind of has two halves. The lower half is all geeky and about arguments and, and diagramming and storytelling and all that. The upper half is, is all squishy and soft stuff. And it's all about trust and vulnerability and and membership and all those kinds of things. And if, if, the, if there's not some vestige of trust um, between the participants, then you never get to the bottom half. The bottom half is irrelevant, immaterial, doesn't matter, nobody gives a shit. 
nobody will see your your pretty chart if they don't trust you at least a little bit enough to, ha to have that conversation so this next is super important mark antoine and I think this is why we care about the map's inclusivity. The question is, somebody comes with a concern, and the question is, how does it fit in your map? <laughs> and, 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 and being able to make that connection. And the map, obviously, to be intelligible, has to simplify and exclude things, because otherwise, it's everything, everywhere, all at once. Nobody can understand it. So the, the one thing I've said many times with Jack is, uh, Jack speaks of wormholes between maps. I think it's very important to be able to say, this is an intelligible whole. It's not everything. Oh, and your thing fits in this other map. And here's how the maps are connected. But the sense making, as I see it, is about making sure that everybody's non-formed thought, they recognize themselves in something a bit more structured. OK, this is what I've been trying to say. Oh, and here's how it fits in. It interacts badly or or well with other viewpoints. And, and but but the, the the connection between the kind of informal discourse and okay, can we make that? How does that check out? I'd love and, that. and those are necessarily local views. And how the dialogue between the local views is very difficult. I think one of the things we want to have happen is for others to show up and say, oh, yes, that object represents what I believe or how I think about this topic. It's a really simple response. <clears throat> um, and, and that object might be a chart, a chart or a diagram. It might be a sentence or a statement. <clears throat> it might be whatever. But when, this, when they can say that speaks for me, that's really good because then we know where they are in the logic map or in the point of view or whatever else. Um, I just want to tell a one minute story about misleading maps. I've only been in one jury trial in my life. It was a car and motorcycle accident in San Francisco that happened right where <clears throat> the Costco was. And I was the only motorcycle rider left on the jury. The two guys who showed up with motorcycle jackets with their helmets were excused by the car, the car guy's lawyer. And in the jury room at the end of the first day, <clears throat> an hour from the end of our time where we we're going to have to come back, I figured out that the expert witness for the car was lying like a rug because he had done, he had shown a, a drawing of the intersection and he had shown where the cars were, et cetera, et cetera. And there's this dent on the door, which, you know, the poor motorcycle guy had a BMW. So there's this pretty print of a horizontal cylinder on the side of the door of the car. Anyway, um, it turns out that at that point in the street, <clears throat> which I knew because I was on the motorcycle, the street goes from being one way to being two way. And if you were riding a motorcycle to go home up uh, south out of San, downtown San Francisco, you would have been in the right-hand lanes, not in the first or second lane, which is what the car guy was claiming. And so the, the, the map was a complete misdrawing of the intersection and nobody had checked, nor did the motorcycle lawyer guy, guy check. Nobody did. And I'm, I'm like, I know this intersection. And everybody's like, yeah. And so we found for the motorcycle guy. <laughs> but, the, but the drawing was lying. And I'm not sure what I did was an ex entirely legit. Like, I don't think you're supposed to find facts in the jury room, but everybody agreed. And when I went back and looked at the intersection, I was like, yep, no way. <clears throat> um, so we have that as well. I'm going to have to melt off the call, I'm afraid. And I'm happy to, to turn the con over to anybody who'd like to keep going on the call. I'll try to listen to it later. And I'm re we're recording. So that'll work out just fine. And uh, probably other people need to go as well. Michael? Michael, the floor is yours. Yeah, I just wanted to to uh, jump on what Nancy was saying um, about about differentiating and the notion differentiating what what sense making is and the notion that that infographic that she used as a metaphor to refer to is the sort of conclusion that we're trying that someone is trying to convince someone of the the sense they've made as opposed to sense making apparatus that says you know gathering information from our information overload is itself a sense making step then organizing that information by tagging by mapping you know by observing the metadata is a sense making stage and then the collective verification via 
you know, upvotes and, and reputation and stuff on those individual elements. Like, it's almost like stop there and then you have something more useful for drawing your own conclusions that might or might not ever feed back into the sense making apparatus. But, you know, better, better conclusions will be reached with that kind of sense making apparatus, not like, hey, now I'm going to write the editorial that that supports my position. Um, you know, better editorials will be written, but it's it's not that editorial made it making and the yes, I'm right thing that is the sense making. If that makes sense. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, are there people who'd like to stay on the call longer who I can turn the call over to or shall we melt this call? I think we have not reached a conclusion. We're unlikely to do it now, but I think we have progressed. And I think I we feel need like to- we got somewhere. But, but I think we need to continue this. We're not done and we should all be there. I agree. Um, there being no takers for continuing the conversation, let's schedule another call like this um, soon. Alas, we are into the holidays right now, um, so let's figure it out gingerly through the holidays. And I just want to wish everybody a fabulous, um, fabulous set of holidays. If I don't see you until the new year, yeah. Nancy, thanks for joining. Rob, glad you made it here. Thanks, guys. <laughs>